All right, I would like to invite Dr. Ganju to come up and and using your polling, room 204C is the code. And if you could answer, fatigue has no impact on my mental acuity or surgical proficiency. Agree or disagree? Okay, we'll give you just a couple more seconds to answer. Just hit your refresh button. I'm sorry, there's a few little bugs in this, but we are getting a good number of responses. We'll try to get those kinks worked out for you. Okay, let's go ahead and close the poll. So 90% disagree. I don't think that's too surprising. Okay, we have one more question on this topic. So fatigue has no impact on the mental acuity or surgical proficiency of neurosurgical residents. Agree or disagree? No. This is a separate question, so just go ahead and enter this. This is about neurosurgical residents as opposed to your personal self. Does fatigue impact your residents? Okay, we'll go ahead and close that poll. Okay, so 94% also disagree. Okay, so Dr. Gondry. Okay, uh, very interesting. Um, I'll tell you the jury is still out um, as to the answers to those two questions, but hopefully um, this afternoon I'll present some data that will be of interest to the group. I'd like to thank the scientific committee for inviting us to talk about this. Um, the effective call on neurosurgical residents' skills and what are the implications for policy, healthcare policy. Okay. Uh, this research was carried out at Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, we collaborated with um, surgical educators over at Arizona State University and also the Banner Good Sam Hospital in Phoenix, Arizona. Just some background as to what the impetus was for the study. As you all know, in July of 2003, the ACGME instituted the work hour restrictions. Uh, as such, at that time, the 80-hour work week um, or uh, work restrictions were applied universally to all U.S. residency programs. About five years after this, in uh, 2008, the Institute of Medicine released a report that actually called for further restrictions to be applied to residency programs in the U.S. In response to this, the ACGME convened in March of 2009 essentially to critically review the uh, results of five years' worth of the work hour restrictions um, and, and their efficacy in terms of patient care and also resident education. At that conference, the um, points that were driven home were that, number one, one size does not fit all. Uh, and what do my, uh, I mean by that? Well, medicine is a broad specialty, and certainly the demands upon the different subspecialties of medicine are very different. Um, and there is data that exists regarding fatigue and uh, surgical proficiency. However, there is no data out there in regards to neurosurgical practitioners. And so we, we decided to look at this. Our hypothesis was that fatigue does not affect the psychomotor and cognitive skills of medical practitioners equally. And specifically, we were interested in addressing what is the effect of fatigue upon the skills of neurosurgical residents. Our methodology, essentially, we created simulation exercises which measure cognitive ability as while performing psychomotor tasks, and these were performed on a uh, computer simulator, if you will. These exercises have been previously validated in several studies by Cahol et al., um, which have measured the impact of fatigue in, general, in the general surgery population. Um, in short, there are nine exercises, all of which are a variation on a basic ring transfer exercise, and they vary in um, amount of difficulty. And I'll show you an example of this later. Uh, this is our setup here, um, computer with the uh, joysticks. This is Dr. Peter Lee, one of our senior residents and one of the co-investigators on this study. And this is a close-up of the uh, joysticks. These are um, by the Sensible um, company. And essentially, this is a haptic joystick. It uh, provides feedback uh, to the subject during the trial. Okay. The subjects performed a session as defined by a pre- and post-call testing, um, wherein the call period was a 24-hour period of sleep deprivation. During each session, they performed six exercises, and for each exercise, there were three parameters that were measured, movement smoothness, elapsed time, and cognitive errors. Um, these, um, the change in skills, both pre- and post-call, were analyzed via, uh, via ANOVA, and statistical significance was taken to BP, less than 
This is the basic exercise here. Once again, it involves, uh, via the joystick, the subject is picking up the rings visually or virtually and placing them on the rings that are, uh, the pegs, rather, that are illuminated. Okay. And I think each exercise consists of the placement of about nine rings. Let's see. I think we're going to have to go all the way through it. Can, we, can you advance? This is another exercise, a little more difficult. Um, in this, a series of pegs are highlighted, either three or four pegs, and the subject needs to sequentially place rings in the correct order on the pegs that were highlighted. So here, it's not only psychomotor tasks that are being tested, but also memory and attention. One more. And this is probably the hardest of the nine exercises in which the board is actually rotating. Uh, and once again, one peg at a time is illuminated. The subject needs to pick up the ring and place it on the appropriate peg. Now, the program will not allow the subject to place a ring on a wrong peg, and they will actually get haptic feedback that tells them they're putting it on the wrong peg. Okay. We can advance. Okay, so we had a total of seven subjects. Uh, these were uh, residents ranging, uh, ranging from PGY2 to PGY5. Each performed a minimum of three and a maximum of four sessions for a total of 26. Once again, each session consisted of both pre- and post-call testing. Six surgical exercises were performed. These were randomly generated. In the analysis of the data, what we saw is that there was no difference in skills between the pre- and post-call states. Specifically, when you looked at the three parameters of movement smoothness, elapsed time, and cognitive errors. More interestingly, when, um, when we look at the mean decrement in surgical proficiency as defined by the average of movement smoothness and cognitive errors, for all residents in the neurosurgery population, in the post-call condition, there was a decrement of about 13%. And in a comparative study done in the general surgery population, their residents showed a decrement in surgical proficiency of 27.3% in the post-call state. Okay. And this is a uh, breakdown, representation of some of that data. You've got the neurosurgeons up top, the general surgeons down below, pre-call, post-call values, and the P. And once again, for the neurosurgeons, none of these uh, held significance. And it's better represented on this bar diagram where the blue bars represent pre-call, green is post-call. First three columns here are neurosurgeons, here are the general surgeons. And we're looking at movement smoothness, time elapsed, and cognitive errors. And once again, for the general surgeons, there was a significant uh, um, more errors um, and less smoothness in the post-call state. And so what's the take home from this? Well, at least in this preliminary study, post-call fatigue was associated with a marginal decrease in both cognitive and psychomotor proficiency in the neurosurgery residents. And our feeling is that the impact of fatigue upon different specialties needs to be better defined uh, prior to some implementation of national work hour restrictions. And what's our future direction? Well, at our institution, we are going to be testing neurology residents, anesthesia residents. Um, I would love to test neurosurgery attendings. Um, and actually, one criticism of the study um, that has been offered for it is that, you know, this in no way approximates real surgery. Um, you know, that is the criticism. And so we do have a computer algorithm that allows for, um, you know, uh, more things that more closely approximate surgery. For instance, suturing, cutting, so on and so forth. And we're hoping to implement that. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Banji. We'll take a question. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm assuming that the Institute of Medicine, when they came out with this decree, had no data to support that other than that's just their feelings about it. Is that it? That is correct. Um, you know, I was at this conference, as I said, in March of 2009. ACGME held a conference um, which had representation from by physicians um, in all the different specialties of medicine and basically to critically review what data is out there regarding the effects of the work hour restriction. And the point that kept uh, getting driven home was there isn't any data out there in regards to increased patient safety or any effect on uh, 
resident education. And the other point that was brought home at that study, there were representatives from the IOM there. Um, essentially, the onus is on us as physicians, as neurosurgeons, to get the data, you know, to, uh, to look into, address the question, provide the data. Otherwise, these restrictions are going to be applied to us without any basis. So that was the impetus, at least for our doing the study. Um, and I think you would all agree. I mean, we as neurosurgeons feel, again, I don't know, invincible, not as, not as the uh, pull pre-presentation suggested. But I think most of us went into the specialty knowing that we were capable of staying up all night and working long hours. You know, I know that I can't sit in a dark room all day. That's why I'm not a radiologist, right? So. Right. Yes, I'd like to ask a question. Have you thought about um, using, um, you know, simulators to actually look at the procedures we do um, on a procedural basis and also the use of uh, multi-centers uh, using simulators and cognitive testing across a wide gambit of, you know, just we're neurosurgeons. I'm not worried about everybody else, uh, you know, against neurosurgeons at different years, first years, third years, fifth years, and how they might function in their traditional roles at the hours that we currently work at versus suggested hours so we can actually demonstrate if there is, in fact, a cognitive dis uh, difference or a, a procedural difference. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'll be brief. Certainly, um, we do have an interest in, you know, carrying out the study at other neurosurgery programs, absolutely, to increase our N, if for no other reason. Um, but I'll tell you, the analysis of our preliminary data showed that if you stratified according to year of training, there was no difference. Versus in the general surgery population, there was a difference, meaning the junior residents, as compared to senior residents versus attendings, junior residents had um, a greater depth decrement in their performance in the post-call condition. One thing briefly, just that we uh, are working on now, is to come up with, um, you know, our feeling is that cognitive skills are probably more effective than psychomotor skills in the fatigued state. So we're coming up with uh, clinical scenarios, you know, um, vignettes, if you will, that residents would take pre- and post-call to try and get at this better. Thank you. Thank you very much.